styles of manufacturing ruled supreme here in the Blackstone Valley in the late 1800s. Noise of blooms like we hear behind us clattered throughout the valley, operated by a skilled workforce. And we're here at the Joseph C. LaFond Company in Manville, Rhode Island, to help us get a feel for the sound of a textile mill in operation. Now, mills like these and many others operated day and night, and they ran several shifts. And the question I have for you today is, where do the workers, those second and third shift workers, go to get a meal? I mean, most of the public eateries were closed after 7, 8 o'clock, well before the shifts were over. Hi, I'm Chuck Arning. I'm a ranger with the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. And the answer to that question lies behind Blackstone Valley entrepreneurs taking advantage of a real need, a good meal, seeing it as an opportunity, and turning that opportunity into American classic. So join me as I grab a cup of coffee, we pick up a little neighborly conversation, and we discover a true American institution, the diner. We're here at the 87 Diner in Whitensville, Massachusetts. And we're talking about the history of diners and the neighborhood feel they have. And one of the best people to talk to about that kind of feel and their history is Randy Garvin, who's the publisher of Roadside Magazine. It deals with diners and their appreciation for their unique situation in American classic culture. And with his uh, girlfriend, Susan Nard, who also is a, a writer and editor for the magazine. And Randy, talking about the history of diners, they really kind of tie together the cities of Providence and Worcester, don't they? Well, yeah, actually, um, in the, you could say the Blackstone Valley is where it all began. Um, the diner, the concept of the diner was invented in Providence, Rhode Island uh, by a man uh, by the name of Walter Scott in 1872. Um, he simply had the idea, well, he, he noticed that after 8 o'clock or so, all the restaurants would close down, but uh, in, that, in that period of our history, all the factories were still humming in second and third shifts, and the workers really didn't have anywhere to go to eat. So he had the idea to, um, to sell food from a, from a lunch wagon, and um, so he converted a, a horse-drawn carriage to something where he could sit inside and dispense food from the inside, and he would uh, serve uh, very, very simple items, um, something called a, a chewed sandwich, which today I guess would be called a, a pulled pork sandwich, uh, coffee and pie. And, um, well, the idea was an immediate hit, uh, and uh, he was um, swamped with customers. He parked himself outside the Providence Journal offices in, um, in Providence, and, um, well, like anything that is a, is a big hit like that, it tends to spawn competitors. And soon there were lunch wagon operators all around Providence. And then that, the idea carried on to, to other towns as well. Not long after that, uh, a Worcester resident by the name of Samuel Jones was uh, in Providence. And he saw what was going on. Maybe not necessarily a Walter Scott's wagon. But um, he noticed, however, that uh, people had to had to um, stand outside to get their food. And whether it was, uh, whether it was hot or cold or raining or, or whatever, and he decided that, well, I'll build one that's a little bit larger so that people could step up inside. And he set up shop in, uh, in Worcester and uh, started building lunch wagons where people could come up inside and sit on a stool and at a counter and they could eat inside if they wanted to or they could take it, they could take it away. So in essence, although Walter Scott invented the concept of the dimer, diner, it was Sam Jones that really um, uh, brought forth the industry of building diners or lunch wagons as they were known back then. And of course, Sam Jones, because of his success, he spawned competitors, uh, mainly in Worcester. The idea of the lunch wagon was spreading like wildfire. You had a lot of people in different towns and cities, really around the, around the Northeast, who said, well, that's a great idea. I can do that too. So there was a lot of it, individual entrepreneurs Converting a a, um, a lunch wagon, converting a horse-drawn carriage into a lunch wagon, um, but 
the industry really took hold in Worcester of building them for other people to buy and set up in their towns. And eventually in the early 1900s, the Worcester, the Worcester Lunch Car Factory, the most, probably the most famous of the area, set up shop and they started building the lunch wagons and then larger. Uh, the lunch wagons kept getting larger and larger until eventually they became diners and then they were um, pretty much shed their wheels and they became stationary items. So uh, pretty much all started here. But this was, you know, this was part of the Gilded Age, and so everyone was trying to outdo each other with how they could, how they could, how ornate they could make their structures, whether they were diners or or, or courthouses. Um, and Buckley was particularly known for that. He would uh, was building what was known as the as the uh, the White House cafes, and these were very ornately designed structures. With uh, the paintings on them were were, um, they were done by craftsmen. These weren't things weren't these things weren't just slapped together. Um, and this was a tradition that was really throughout the uh, throughout the diner building industry, um, and everybody was trying to outdo each other by building a diner that was more ornate or larger, or s seated more or, or whatever. And, um, and and finally, I mean, it, it's one of the things that just drove drove the business. But eventually, in, uh, especially towards the 1920s, there was a, a big effort by uh, diner operators to uh, to invite women into the diners because up until that point. It was largely seen as a working man's um, uh, working man's haven, mainly because you know the language and and all of that. But you started seeing on the sides of diners, ladies invited, and savvy diner owners would do this because they realized that you know this is half their market. This is another potential half the market that they could bring into their diner. Also, it was recognized that you know if a woman ate in your restaurant, then the food must be good. I mean, they first they were being set up in industrial areas, and of course you saw them in in, in mill towns, obviously, because that's where the industrial areas were. So they would set up pretty much close to the heart of town. Eventually, as diners grew up, as it were, you did start seeing them in neighborhoods, and. Um, but then again, the neighborhoods are pretty close to the mills as well. So the diner, in essence, became a focal point for the community starting back then. It was a place for people to gather and exchange news, news items and bits and things like that. Uh, first of all, it's the people that own it that makes it interesting. And the food is always good. And uh, it, it's, there's a certain atmosphere about a diner that it's enjoyable to, to come to, you know? Parkway has, has, has been a landmark in the Shrewsbury Street since, I, I guess they originally opened up in 1935, and it's always been part of the street, you know? Well, I like working with people, and my sister has had standing room only, where people have been lined up outside to come in for breakfast and lunch. Um, at late night, they've been lined up, waiting to come in to get an early morning breakfast after they go out for the night, and it's a lot of fun. It reminds me of a sock hop. <laughs> really? Now, your magazine, Roadside, what are some of the goals and what do you hope to do with the magazine? Well, to show the importance of preserving the diners, um, highlighting the things, what I said to you before, about, uh, about the community aspect of, of diners. This is something, the things that go on in places like this, you will not see happen in, in say, a Wendy's or a McDonald's. Oh, yeah. I mean, there are some incredible yeah. stories that we've heard of diner owners giving people who are, whose car is broken down the keys to their own car so that they can go to their, to their business meeting. And, uh, and when the person comes back, I mean, they're a customer for life. They bring back their family. Um, lots of little stories like that. There are diners where the regulars are so regular that if they're not in at the time that they're always there, the owners can pretty much assume something is wrong. And in fact, uh, this, this happened once in one diner. And, um, they had somebody go look after the man, and sure enough, he was he was very ill in his apartment, and they called an ambulance, and basically the diner saved his life. Um, it, it's a lot of little homespun aspects like that that are completely lost when you in in a na in a national franchise. Um, working here, a lot of people have questions about the diner, and they tell you stories about how they got engaged in, in this very diner and okay. stuff like that. Yeah, and it's really it's cute. It's cute. How's the status of diners here in the Blackstone Valley? Well, it, it's, it's not great. Um, 
frankly, uh, Worcester and Providence are still doing pretty good. I mean, Worcester is uh, is number four as far as the number of diners within its city limits, number four in the country, behind New York, Philadelphia, and Allentown. Um, Providence has, I think, about six diners, and uh, most of them still operating. Uh, and between the two cities, um, well, you've got uh, you've got two in Pawtucket, you've got this one, you've got one in Millbury, um, and uh, you've got the uh, one in Shrewsbury. Uh, but I mean, we we published a map of Massachusetts locating all the diners that we knew about at the time. There was about 140, which was more than we thought. But in doing the research, you realize that at one time there was a diner, there was probably at least one diner in every significant town in the, in the state, which meant there could have been, you know, between four to six hundred diners in Massachusetts at their peak, you know. Um, well, as Worcester may have 16, and that might sound like a lot, that's probably down from about 30. Um, so, but the ones that are still here are tend to be doing pretty well, and we really like the ones in this area. I mean, we're, I'm, I'm a native New Englander myself, and I tend to have a really soft spot for little, little Worcester diners like this one. One of the things that uh, is probably the most threatening to diners these days is, uh, is the way that um, the commercial landscape is being developed. I mean, no longer do you see a lot of um, uh, towns really trying to bring um, businesses, good businesses, into their downtown areas. And in, and in Massachusetts, that's where a lot of the better diners are. Uh, a town like Millbury, for instance, I mean, there was a big effort to bring in the mall. Well, the mall's going to go on the outskirts of town, drawing even more business away from their downtown. And there's a beautiful diner in downtown Millbury. Same sort of thing goes on here in, in Whitensville and in a lot of these mill towns. One of the things we'd like to see, I mean, part of the general preservation effort is sort of the rediscovery of the urban environment because uh, diners that are part of neighborhoods like that uh, tend to be the best ones. And I mean, frankly, we think uh, one of the things that we like to say is that good diners make good neighborhoods. So if you encourage the, the placement of diners in neighborhoods, then it's something that's going to help bring your whole town back. You know, diners have that real neighborhood feel to them. They've got their own sounds, their own smells, their own neighborhood chatter. And the food's really good, too. But it's something you really have to experience firsthand. Hey, let me show you. Diners have that tremendous neighborhood feel to them. And we're here with John Evangelista, who's the owner of the Parkway Diner. And John, I want to ask you, why do people come to diners? People come because of the good food. Uh, they come because of the warm friendliness that I showed them. And the price is right. That's the reason why they come to the Parkway Diner. Our menu you now hasn't really changed in the last 40 years. We basically kept it the same. Probably added a few things, but not too many more because Many of the fellas and people who come here, they come, uh, some of them are married to uh, Irish and Greek and uh, Polish, where their wives can't cook all the dishes that we have. So mom is gone, so they come to the Parkway Diner and John acts as their mom. And we make them uh, pasta fagioli and escarole and beans and stuffed squid and eggplant and many, many, many other uh, good Italian dishes that they don't get at home anymore. So they come here. And I get a lot of the, other than Italians, I get Irish, Polish, uh, Lithuanians. They come down and I'm beginning to like all these nice Italian dishes too. It's all homemade, isn't it? Everything is homemade. We start right from scratch early in the morning. I'm here at um, 5, 4.30 in the morning and get that <laughs> stove going and uh, my sister's come in and work with me and I think we do a good job. Uh, the neighborhood isn't all strictly Italian like it used to be. We're getting a lot of mixed people in here now, but it has changed because I remember when we first came here, there'd be 30, 40 guys out there playing at Mora which is an Italian game where they play with their hands, you know. And there were times I'd had to go out there and say, hey guys, come on, give us a break. You know, move up a little bit. But it's not there anymore. It's just not there anymore. And the street has really changed a lot. You know? 
it's the best street really in this whole city of Worcester. Work. I do work a lot of hours. The reason why I work a lot of hours is mainly because I own the place and because I have a love for my business. And with me here, I feel that things are running properly. You know, and then of course I have my sisters, my beautiful sister-in-law that's there, and they all give me a, a, a big, big hand. They really have a lot, a lot, a lot of interest. It's been a family business, you know, from the very, very beginning. When you get started in the business, my brother, who is, his name was Lawrence, always had a dream. We lost our mother at a very young age, and um, and uh, he kind of like consoled us in a way that to say, uh, one day I'm going to build you guys a castle and we're all going to be under one roof. And this was his dream. And he heard the Parkway Diner was for sale and, and uh, he bugged our ears for it and he um, we had to raise uh, $8,000, I remember, for a down payment, and we bought the Parkway down there for $33,000. Back 40 years ago, wow, that was like a, like a million dollars. Believe me, it was tough even just to raise $8,000. And, um, and his dream came true. One of the stories I remember is that when we first opened, someone came in and asked my brothers for uh, dropped eggs, and they looked at one of the said, What's dropped eggs? So the other brother said, let's get our hat and coat and let's go home. Uh, because uh, we knew very little about the restaurant business, but we took a chance. Yes, I enjoy them. I really enjoy them. I, I enjoy all the people that come, really. I have a lot of love for all my customers. I think um, it's the home cooking, the uh, personal atmosphere. Um, people who are, tend to go out and dine alone prefer to come to a diner um, instead of going into a restaurant where they're sitting alone. Here you can talk to people and even if there's no one to talk to, you can talk to the cook so you never feel totally alone. For single people and divorced people and people um, who just dine alone, they don't like to sit in a restaurant at a table and there's no atmosphere. Here they can come in and socialize and when they leave they have a better feeling. That's my belief. A lot of local people who come and patronize my business and they're um, here every day. You kinda, it's like a family to me. I enjoy the customers and I like the upfront um, closeness that I receive. It's not every day is you know, rosy, but you know, most of the time it's nice. It's a small diner, it's quaint. And, it's just enough for me. And I love the people. I'm a people person. Yeah. You get your comedians and you get your regular, you know, crabs. <laughs> but uh, all in all, it's nice. I have uh, daily specials, but um, I tend to serve uh, the same breakfasts almost every day. Some are special items one day, and the next day it's the same. It's the menu. But in a diner, you kind of tend to go to a mill town. Millbury is like a mill town and I have like a Milltown menu, hamburger steaks, which is probably my best seller in the diner, shepherd's pie, American chop suey, liver and onions. Um, what I do make is all my own homemade spaghetti sauce, meatballs, that's all homemade. And um, the Italian sausage is um, quite probably one of my best sellers with eggs. But all our omelets are fresh vegetables and our home fries are fresh. Our mashed potatoes are fresh, our gravies are fresh. That's great. I try to stay with the trend of homemade cooking. Every day is an adventure in the diner because here we have no kitchen. There is no other way. What you see is what you get. So you might walk in and I'll be making meatballs and cooking your eggs. It's just homemade and um, the customers tend to accept it and it's kind of fun. They see what you're, they're getting so there's no hidden, um, you know, behind the kitchen as they say. This diner was built by Worcester Lunch Cot in 1935, and the Gillett family purchased it and placed it here in 1936, where they had already had a, a going operation. And in 1936, it was put here brand new, and it's been here ever since. It never was a railroad station. Like some people think it's a lunch cot from a train, but it isn't. It actually was made for this um, site. The interior of the diner is um, basically as it was. The tiles are all the original tiles. The um, wood is all oak. The only replacement that I know of is the ceiling, which you mean installed probably six years ago, seven years ago. But other than that, everything is um, as it was. 
the windows are stained glass and it's called the double stained glass. They reflect a different color on the outside. The screens in the summer, you lift up uh, the screens and they attach right to the windows so they lay in between the walls of the diner. And the um, ventilation system that was used in the 30s, 40s, and 50s were the windows that you look up above. They all unscrew and that was how the heat came up and um, left the diner if it was too hot before air conditioning mm. became very popular. Oh yeah, I get a lot of people traveling that come in and they want to take pictures and I say, sure, go ahead. What is it that brings people to diners? I think it's uh, the uh, people that we have coming here, a lot of them are from the city of Pawtucket. So they, um, they remember when the diner was actually into the city. Uh, we, we have them ranging from the older people that, that remember it well to the, the parents that brought the kids here. So I would say it's second, third generation, and they just remember it uh, as, as a nice place to come, to kind of hang out in. Um, it's a family place. Uh, the atmosphere is casual. Um, and it's always worked. It's, a, it's just a nice you know, atmosphere to kind of come hang out. Modern's been kind of like an institution here in Pawtucket, hasn't it? For 40 years, uh, for over 40 years. Yeah. Has the menu changed much over time? Uh, most, most of the staples have remained the same. The uh, meatloaf, the chicken pot pie, the, um, the uh, croquettes. The, those people want, so we uh, keep them. But we have changed uh, as far as the uh, breakfast is. We've, we've gone more of the, um, I call it artsy fartsy, but it's, it's more of like the, uh, the nouveau cooking now. We depend on the repeat customers because when we're not in a, a very high traffic area, so uh, most of our business would, would be repeat. The, the first week or the first couple of weeks that we started here, uh, everyone was curious in the city of Pawtucket. And what happened was that we never expected the entire city to come in like their first week. And it was, uh, to say the least, difficult. And you get a lot of students coming in from the different colleges in the area, don't you? Johnson Wales is, uh, Johnson Wales Bar University in RISD is, fi is five miles straight up the street. Uh, on weekends we have, um, I would say, at least 30% of the uh, business is Johnson Wales and uh, RISD. The uh, RISD kids love it because they're, they're in the art schools and they look at the architecture, the woodwork, the glass. So, you know, it, it's perfect for them to come in and snap, snap pictures. I didn't realize, but when, when this diner was built, where you're sitting, they, they had glass counters that you see through, and they, they would display all their pies in the pastries. So as you're eating, you're all looking at all the pastries. They're taking the pot and like how they used to actually expand it, because the uh, diner's in sections, and if you wanted to expand, stretch it, it's not hard to stretch this diner to make it bigger. Meet the young kids from the colleges and stuff, and they like the nostalgia of it, and that's, you meet all kinds, it's fun. Now what's the connection between diners and neighborhood development? Well, the best person to ask about that is Daniel Zilka, who's director of the American Diner Museum, which is going to be located right here in Providence. And Dan, diners and neighborhoods, they have a really good connection, don't they? They do, they do, because the, the diners were community gathering places. You could go into a diner and hear all the news, the gossip from the neighborhoods. And it was also a, a place that was a, a democratic eating table. Anyone from the neighborhood could go there. The, the businessmen sitting next to the police, sitting next to students, sitting next to blue collar workers. Everybody got the same food at the same prices. There's a lot of diners that have been shifted to an upscale, but I think the most popular ones and the ones that ha are dearest to people's hearts are the ones that have that, that have that flavor to them. Now, do you have any particular favorites that kind of capture that neighborhood feel? Here in Providence? Yeah. To me, it's the, the Prairie Diner on the corner of Public and Prairie. Uh, it's a diner that was put there since, it's been there since 1924. Now, it's not much to look at right now, is it? No, it isn't. It's, uh, it, it, it was in a neighborhood that went through a downturn during the 50s and 60s and 70s, and it's sort of making a revival now. And, and it had its uh, bad times. It was a 24-hour diner, and the owners had to cut back because of the, the crime in the neighborhood. But now it, it, it's become a landmark for the community, and the people of the community see it as their diner, which is a real important uh, part of uh, a successful diner, I think. 
the diner can serve as a kingpin, that if a diner is restored and preserved in a certain neighborhood, people see it as part of the, the neighborhood or come back to the neighborhood. Now, what are the, some of the ingredients that a diner owner must have to be successful? I think there's, I think there's three of them, and they're very, very simple. Uh, a diner owner should, have to, should love to work with food, should love to work long hours, and love people. And my thought is, if you don't have those three things, you shouldn't be in the, shouldn't be in the business, because those are very, very key. And the people who do the best in the business, they have those. Yeah. If I have to cook, I can cook. If I have to wash dishes, I know how to wash dishes. If I have to be a waiter, I have to be a waiter. I've done them all. It's There's the nothing I haven't side. done. You know what I mean? I'm a real man. I, it's, it's my business, and I have to keep it going. And there were days, like I said, you take Saturdays, I was out of oh. sight busy. Oh. Okay? Now here it is. I've been already for like 15 hours in Saturday. The waitress don't show up. I go upstairs to wash my face, comb my hair, put a clean apron on. And I became a waiter for another three hours. Until, you know, I kind of like toned down a little bit and I knew they could handle it. You know? Or a girl doesn't show up in the kitchen, I'm like, here, my hair, my guy, I'm like, I'm not going to do it. It's my bread and butter, it's my life, it's my reputation. So. Now, as director of the American Diner Museum, what are some of your goals and how do you see that as helping the diner owners in the preservation of their wonderful uh, eating establishments? I think what, what we're, our, our main goal is to, the kinder and appreciation for diners. And we're beginning to realize that if we can keep the, to help keep the diner owners and keep them in business, that's the best preservation, to keep a, the diner business a viable business uh, and to tell people why it's important. Because uh, in a lot of places in America, you have all the fast food restaurants and you have the strip developments. They start looking like everywhere else in America. And because most of the diners are owner operated uh, by certain individuals or certain families, it has a unique flavor. Each diner has a very unique flavor to it, like, like this over top here. They're unique, they're unique to America. There were only so many diners built and that they were built as diners. They weren't built as from converted trolleys or they're not railroad cars. And that each one has a unique history about it. And I really see them as living history. They were, they were, they're still being used for what they were built for. And I think here in the Blackstone Valley, we're lucky to have quite a few of them that are still, still in business. The only way you're gonna be successful in the business is that you have gotta put love in it. And if you don't put love in it, forget it. If you don't you do on these fly-by nights, then it's not gonna work. And that's why we've been successful, because we put our heart and soul into it. And this was an opportunity for us uh, in all the years, you know, we've never had nothing. We've come from a very poor family. And this was an opportunity to make good, and we've made good. Every one of us have done it. In the castle. And the kids all became educated. We've got doctors, lawyers, and Indian chiefs. All because of the Parkway Diamond, because of the castle that my brother, the one had a dream, said we'll all be under one roof. And from here, like I said, many castles were built for you. So it's a part of the story. It's a great Well, now you know why the diner is a true American institution. You don't need to be a high-tech junkie to know that the information highway leads right to your local diner. Where else can you eat well and get the lowdown on what's happening in your community or neighborhood? Well, this has been National Park Service Ranger Chuck Arning with the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. And I think you need to find your way to one of the many classic diners found right here in the Blackstone Valley. The food's great, the conversation is absolutely stimulating, and there's a hot cup of joe waiting for you right now. So what's keeping you?